This is episode 68. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archie Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archie Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archieoffice.com. Today's guest is Thomas R. Fisher. Thomas Fisher is a professor of architecture and the dean of the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. He leads the revolutionary design program there, and he also writes extensively on architecture and design. He's a frequent contributor to Architect Magazine. Well, Tom, I want to welcome you to the business of architecture. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be here. Now, uh, I, I saw an article by you in uh, Architect Magazine a while ago talking about the case for higher fees, and in there you talked, you made some interesting points about value-added design. Would you tell me a little bit about what prompted you to write that particular article? Well, I come from a family of architects. My grandfather was an architect, and as I grew up um, listening to the woes of running an architectural um, business, and um, what always struck me about those conversations uh, was that I th I've always felt that architecture creates uh, a great deal of value for clients and communities that uh, is rarely reflected in the fees we get. Um, you know, the other side of my family are all doctors, and the medical community has, I think, done a great job of demonstrating its value and its compensation has reflected that. And so the article that I wrote in Architect Magazine was really uh, one effort among many that I've made in several books over the years to make the case that the architectural profession needs to do a much better job documenting its value and um, quantifying that in a way that's compelling to clients um, so that the fee conversation is a much different one than what most firms now face. And you gave some. Could you give some suggestions for how firms could think about doing that? What are some ways to make that value proposition? Well, I think that um, you know one of the uh, uh, sort of catch twenty twos here is that uh, our fees are too low for architects to go back to their projects over time to actually do the documentation necessary to get our fees higher. Okay, could you and, explain that? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, um, it, most architects know is that y you barely have enough fee to, to do the schematic design, design development, uh, um, contract documents, and CA work. Uh, often by the time the building is done, um, if you have any fee left, you're lucky. And, uh, and so there's uh, really uh, almost no compensation available to go back to your buildings. There are, is really no other outside funder that encourages um, uh, this kind of uh, post-occupancy evaluation of, of our buildings. Uh, and, uh, and so the dilemma there is that the way in which we're going to be able to quantify our value um, depends on going back over time and assessing that value in partnership with our clients. And yet there's no fee to do that. And yet our fees, uh, I think, are not going to go up until we do that work. 
So one of the things I have talked about is that I think there needs to be a different um, relationship between uh, architectural firms and architecture schools. And I blame the schools as much as anything for this because um, uh, it used to be, for example, and when my grandfather was educated in the Beaux-Arts system, that one of the first things students did was go to an existing building and assess it. Um, and uh, I think that is a, is a great introduction to architecture is to have students actually return to existing buildings uh, and document the value they created, how they're working, um, what uh, improved productivity their their owners have uh, realized, uh, how has the uh, assessed value or resale value of a house gone up as a result. Um, uh, you know, there's a whole set of measures and criteria that um, one could imagine um, to base this work on and to actually use the schools as a research partner where the schools go back, do this work as part of the education of students, and then make this information available to all the firms um, so that the conversations that we have with uh, uh, clients is very different. I believe my hypothesis, which I think is uh, actually there's already evidence to this effect, that um, we save our clients far more than what they pay us. And so we're on the wrong side of the ledger. We're viewed as a cost by clients when, in fact, uh, we need to be viewed for what we really are, which is we're on the saving side of the ledger for clients. And so the conversation with clients about fees would really need to be one of how much do you want to save? If you don't want to pay us very much, we won't be able to save you nearly as much as we could if you pay us more. And that to me is where we need to uh, be and where we need to head. And what are some ways in which architects are on the saving side of the ledger? Well, for example, uh, you know, I was at a uh, conference um, uh, where uh, Ed Mazaria from Architecture 2030 gave a talk, and he's quantified just the energy savings to clients over the last uh, decade, and I forget how many trillions of dollars it is. So I, after his remarks, I raised my hand and I asked Ed, so Ed, what do you think all the fees of all the architects in that last decade were? And I went back and, and he didn't know, but I went back and I calculated it. It was a, a fraction of what architects have saved their clients. So just in terms of energy savings, architects have saved clients multiple times uh, what we've been paid. And and that's just on the energy side. Now, we know, for example, that at least in um, commercial non-residential buildings, um, the, the biggest cost to a client are their uh, employees' salaries. And uh, there's evidence that new buildings better suited to a client's needs um, improve productivity. So improved productivity, reduced absenteeism, reduced turnover, all these things are extremely expensive to clients. Uh, our work actually reduces those expenses to clients, and uh, and I and I guarantee, given the salary load in most businesses, that that savings far exceeds what they've paid the, the architect. But because we haven't done the the work to connect these things, we can't make these arguments very effectively. It's all anecdotal. And to me, that's what needs to change, is we we have to go beyond what I see happening too much is this sort of vague reference to, oh, yeah, architecture improves the quality of life and makes people happier or feel good. I mean, there's been a lot of this kind of rhetoric in the past, but it's never been quantified. It's never um, – there's never been a hard-nosed case, business case – for exactly what we save clients, because what, if we and when we do that, it will be amply evident that um, the effort of clients to sort of reduce architects' fees is stupid. Um, that's such a first of all, it's such a small cost in the entire project, but even more so um, by reducing the time an architect has to work on a project, it simply makes it more difficult to achieve these savings.
Mm -hmm. And do you know any, are there any schools out there or firms that are moving in this direction of being able to do some of these things? Well, at the University of Minnesota, we've been uh, uh, starting this effort. So we've developed a research practice consortium with a number of firms here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region uh, in which we have uh, graduate students working in a research capacity in the firms uh, doing this kind of research. And um, I think at first there were many firms kind of skeptical of it, and but there were a few um, early adopters, and uh, this has already begun to pay off for these firms. Uh, uh, they've seen um, in, uh, greater business. They've, they've uh, actually received commissions because of the research these students are doing for them, as well as they're uh, having better fee conversations with clients because of this work. And so now there are a growing number of offices in town here who want to join this effort because they see uh, how little it costs them and how much they gain from it. And so this was our initial effort to try to demonstrate a new kind of relationship between a school of architecture and the uh, practitioner community in which our students' research can directly benefit the bottom line of firms. And we also share that information in the consortium. So it isn't just firm A benefits, but all the firms in the consortium benefit from all the work that everyone is doing. And what are some of the things that you're seeing? Can you give me any examples of some research that's been done? Well, for example, um, uh, what this has allowed firms to do is to have a much better sense of the business case of the clients uh, that they're going in to interview for commissions and uh, to go after commissions for. So um, the firms will often be able uh, have have gone into uh, interviews where they know exactly where the um, business concerns are the client, uh, and so in the interview they can directly address how the new facility will address a particular issue. They can also um, pinpoint where the cost levers are for a client, and so in the interview show how the building will directly address and reduce some of the client's highest cost drivers. And uh, clients, of course, uh, are viewing this as um, not just a generic presentation by an architect, but here's an architect coming in who knows my business, is concerned about reducing my costs, improving my productivity, has ideas about it. And um, I tell you, when you hear that as a client, you're much more likely to commission that firm. They, they already understand your problem and your business and want to partner with you to solve it. You know, I'm often on a lot of architect selection processes here in the Twin Cities where I'm on the client side listening to architects present. And I think our profession has a real problem in the sense that I, I often know these architects, and, and I have to confess, so many of them all sound alike. Their work looks alike. They all sound alike. They all say roughly the same thing. And clients end up making a decision based on, well, who has the lowest fees or you know, or even more absurdly, who had the best presentation, um, irrelevant issues. And so part of this research is um, to change that whole dynamic so that firms aren't showing their work, which, frankly, most clients don't care about. They don't really care about what you've done for other clients, other than maybe that you have some knowledge about that building type. What they really want to hear from you is what are you going to do to help them and help their their problem get addressed. And so those firms that can do that upfront research and are informed about that going to the interview stand a much greater chance of getting the commission. And also um, a much greater chance in getting the kind of fees necessary to actually solve the problem, the business problem of the client. That leads to a whole other issue, which is that um, I believe the profession needs to move to a future in which buildings are only one of many, many services we offer clients. And that buildings are not the end of our relationship with a client, but the beginning of our relationship with a client. And that there are so many other design problems that clients have that architects do not take advantage of, even though frequently in the process of doing the building, we learn about some of those other design challenges of the client. 
And so I think we're moving in a direction that actually the legal profession went into in the 20th century toward um, seeing its traditional core business. In the case of lawyers, it was going to trial, trying cases in court. Now fewer than 50% of lawyers ever set foot in a courtroom. And I think we're moving in the same direction so that our core traditional business of designing buildings um, will still be an important part of our work, but it may be at some point in the near future less than 50% of what architects are doing because the number of other design problems far are, far exceed the need for a building. Well, as, and Tom, as, as a building owner yourself, what are, can you give me an example of some of those problems that architects can solve maybe some of the um, the biggest opportunities out there that don't involve building design? Uh, well, uh, uh, let me give you an example of a project we did for uh, one of the counties here. They came to us because there were it was in their juvenile detention facilities. There were fights breaking out in the waiting rooms. And so they asked us to look at uh, the waiting room problem, and um, basically I think we're expecting from us a redesign of their waiting rooms. And what we looked at is we started to talk to people about why the fights were occurring. Well, the fights were occurring because the juvenile detention system was so dysfunctional that um, the fights in the waiting rooms were more the symptom of a much deeper problem. So we showed them how they could redesign their waiting rooms, but then we said, but let us show you the breakdowns in the juvenile detention system in your processes and in your communications. And we diagrammed the entire juvenile detention system for them, which we learned about in the process of doing this waiting room work. They had never seen their operations diagrammed nor had they ever realized where the breakdowns were occurring. And so uh, we did the waiting room work, and, and this, you know, quite a bit later, maybe I think it was about a year or so, we, they, they called us back and said, you know, we'd like to engage you in looking at the redesign of our system. And then since then, we've been asked by this county to, to look at the redesign of other systems. So we've just done a study of their homeless homelessness system, which also had all kinds of problems. And so this idea of system redesign, which utilizes all the tools that we use as architects, it's about um, assessing what people are actually doing, diagramming, um, identifying bottlenecks and other kinds of problems as we would in in laying a plan out, for example, and uh, suggesting a more efficient cost-effective way of operating um, to clients. Uh, And these are enormously valuable services that architects could provide. Very few other people do this work. Architects have all the tools to do it, and we learn about these processes in the process of doing the building. So that's what I mean. The building is sort of an entree into the client's world. And um, one of the biggest differentiators between the compensation of architects and, let's say, lawyers, is lawyers have a tremendously high percentage of repeat work, where they're, um, particularly those who work on sort of the corporate side, where they're essentially the counselors, the legal counselors to uh, companies and organizations. And uh, architects need to, I believe, play and could and should play a similar role to clients, which is to say that we're there when you need a building, but we're also there for you to help you redesign other aspects of your operations. Sounds very similar to the pioneering work that IDEO, the firm um, design firm, has done. Do you know any other architecture or design firms that are kind of expanding the limits of design in that way? Well, there are a few. I mean, Gensler, for example, has been growing its sort of, I forget what they call it, but basically they have a strategy group. Um, You're right, IDO has been doing a lot of this service and system redesign work. Um, um, Pentagram is another firm that uh, does get into this on occasion. Um, But given the amount of work there is and the number of firms doing it, it's way... um, out of whack. Uh, there's far more work that needs to be done, should be done, uh, than there are firms doing it. So this is a huge business opportunity for firms 
But it does require thinking about ourselves differently, that we have got to stop thinking, I'm an architect, I do buildings. And what we have to start thinking about ourselves as is, I'm an architect, I'm a strategic thinker, and I am a spatial analyst, and I am able to visualize problems and uh, come up with creative solutions, of which a building is only one outcome of that way of working. And how do you think a sole practitioner, someone that does primarily residential buildings, could apply, uh, do some of this in their work? Well, I think that... um, you know, this uh, applies at a different, in a different way to uh, residential properties. Um, you know, for example, um, we have a, a, a really perverse uh, system upon which our fees are based, right? Which is the the bigger the the house, the the bigger the budget, the more fees we get. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, this way of thinking actually. Uh, would reverse that, which would to say, let let us show you um, how you can do more with less. Let let me show you how you may think you need a 10,000 square foot house. Let me show you how you're really wasting a lot of money in, in that. And let me show you how I, you can achieve all that you want and more in half that space. And um, uh, and I will take my fee according to how much I save you. So I will be paid according to uh, how much I can reduce the expense you're putting in and still achieve the same. Now, I do acknowledge there are some clients who are just very rich and they want the 10,000 square foot house because they don't care about money and you know it's a status thing for them so i mean it's it's possible that there are clients who don't care about saving money in fact the goal of doing a building is to show how much money they have so it, there may be cases where um this way of thinking doesn't matter but the number of people who don't care about saving money or the number of people who are happy with wasting money um is i think a relatively small number um and we also have, I believe, a professional responsibility uh, that goes beyond just doing whatever the client wants us to. I mean, we are, you know, using too many resources. We're using too much energy. Uh, we're having too much. We're doing too much damage to the to, you know, sites and and ecosystems. And so, even if you have an extremely rich client who doesn't care about saving money and wants to do something lavish because they can afford it. I would also argue that architects have a responsibility to um, look to larger uh, obligations that we have and still try to do um, uh, more with uh, with less. Mm-hmm. And those larger obligations you're talking about would be the ethical side? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. The, uh, you know, it, uh, we are doing a lot of... Uh, not only damage to the planet, but, you know, so what are we going to say to our grandchildren when they look at us and they ask us, so why did you guys use up all the oil? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what are you going to say? What are we going to say to our grandkids? Sorry, didn't mean to, but, you know, hey, too bad we got here first. Because that's exactly what we're doing. We're using up all the cheap oil, all the available oil. There's still be oil on the planet, but it's going to be so difficult to get that it's going to be extremely expensive to the point where our grandchildren and great-grandchildren can't afford it. And they're going to look at us and say, so why in a generation or two did you use it all up? And that's exactly the kind of issue that I think we have an obligation. It's not just, oh, you know, right, it's all it's about ethics. No, it's about, you know, fundamentally, uh, what are our obligations to future generations and what gives us the right to use all of these resources up? Um and so, in a way, it doesn't matter how much our clients have. We have an obligation that goes beyond, you know, meeting some extraordinary, wasteful um, lifestyle of, of the rich and the famous. Now, Tom, as someone with both feet, uh, one foot, I guess, in the architecture industry and one foot in the academic industry, for other firms out there that are um, in college towns or towns with universities, how would you suggest that architects reach out to their local academic institutions. Can you give them any suggestions for how to open up that dialogue and maybe start a similar thing in their in their local area? 
Yeah, well, uh, first thing to do would be call the dean or the department head and um, say you want to meet. Uh, maybe you bring uh, some of the articles I've written or there's the, uh, Design Intelligence ran an article about our research practice consortium. I think it's also been in Architect Magazine. Br bring that with you and say, we want to start one of these here. What do you, how can you help? Um, and, you know, we've been talking about this w on the academic side with fellow deans and, and heads of schools, and they're very interested. Uh, it is a little bit more of a challenge for schools that are in small towns, um, f sort of far away from urban centers, but it's certainly not impossible. And I think it can take a variety of forms. I, I think what we've uh, piloted here in Minnesota is only is, a, is one version, but there could be other versions. Um, but I think um, reach out to the school and, and just say, we'd like to start one here. Well, how can we help? Well, what can we do together? I guarantee you there isn't a dean or department head in this country that will say no, not interested. <laughs> Well, Tom, I know for a fact that there are people listening right now who there's a light bulb going off and they're thinking, this would be great. This is an opportunity. I should do this. So I want to encourage those people who are listening, the, you know who you are, to take action on this. You know, Don't just listen to this and think, oh, that's a great idea, but actually go ahead and do it and then report back. Let me know. Uh, we'll get you in touch with Tom as well. You can report back and, and sort of, this would be great if it could spread and be, uh, this would be a way which... Uh, these kind of ideas could spread in architecture because it seems like this would be something that would really help the industry. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I agree. And uh, it's in all of our uh, best interests to do this. It isn't just a nice thing to do. I think it's actually how the profession uh, is going to survive and thrive in the future. Well, Tom, I think that's a great place to end the first half of our interview, so I want to thank you for being on the Business of Architecture. Well, happy to be here. Thanks okay. for having me. All right. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.